the next session will be uh, present by Professor Manjari Tripati. She will speak about medical management for epilepsy. What is new? Welcome, uh, Prof. Manjari. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening. I would like to thank. I would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, for asking me to talk uh, at this forum. And uh, with this, I'll uh, begin my uh, uh, slide presentation. I, at the outset, I'd like to know how many neurologists are uh, attending this meeting, approximately. Uh, all of the attendees now is uh, 657. Yeah. So how it's many of be... them? How many of them are neurologists, and how many of them are neurosurgeons? Uh, after the Zoom, we, we can we can. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. after the last session, they they okay. will uh, conclude that. Okay, so I'll go to my uh, slide presentation, and uh, I was asked to talk on uh, medical management. Uh, uh, of uh, uh, epilepsy and what is new. Uh, well, there are several things which are new, um, but uh, I would confine myself to talking about uh, uh, how to choose an appropriate anti-epileptic drug. Uh, we know that seizures uh, and epilepsy have been classified uh, as late as 2017. Uh, and to simplify uh, the latest classification, has divided seizures uh, into focal onset, generalized onset, and unknown onset. Um, when we see patients, we not only try to find out what seizure type they have, but we also try to find out what is the cause of seizures. Uh, is it a structural cause? Is it a genetic cause? Is it immune? Is it metabolic? Or uh, is it something uh, which is uh, related to some infection in the past? Uh, or uh, we really don't know why the seizures are happening. And then, of course, based on the seizure type, uh, we also try to find out whether the patient has only uh, focal epilepsy or has a generalized epilepsy or has combined focal and generalized epilepsy, or we really don't know what kind of epilepsy they have. Some of our patients will have epilepsy syndromes like Lenox-Castor syndrome, Dravet syndrome, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, and many of our patients, most of our patients, as high as 60% or so, may have comorbidities, either in the form of behavioral and psychiatric and cognitive comorbidities. Now, it is very important to remember that the diagnosis of epilepsy is a clinical diagnosis. So it depends a lot on the eyewitness, that is the person who has actually seen the seizure. And hence, uh, one must take the history of the seizures from the eyewitness. And of course, uh, one must also go into what happened before the event, during the event, and after the event. Uh, also, we must take the history of any focal uh, neurological symptoms, uh, any family history, any pre-morbid conditions like head injury or past infections or febrile seizures in childhood, and also take the treatment history and several drugs which could provoke seizures uh, like, you know, simple drugs like ciprofloxacin, ofloxacin, uh, or tramadol. Um, for all you know, the patient may not be having epilepsy and may be having no seizures due to these drugs. One must then examine the patient and, of course, do supportive investigations, most important of which is EEG and neuroimaging. Now, uh, the history has to be taken very meticulously and in slow motion followed by examination, followed by investigations. There are a lot of differentials, which, ha which are uh, uh, differentials in, uh, you know, uh, which could produce paroxysmal symptoms. So uh, anybody who has a syncope, whether it's a cardiac syncope, whether it's a postural syncope, anybody who's had a TIA or a mild stroke, which has lasted only for a few hours, or a transient global amnesia, uh, sleep disorders like narcolepsy, cataplexy, drug-induced, other neurological disorders like uh, uh, spasms of multiple sclerosis, psychogenic seizures, all these uh, are uh, very important differentials and of course in the elderly falls. Uh, what helps us particularly in India is because many a times the patient's attendants are not able to give us a proper history is to ask them to make a home video on a mobile phone of the event. So many of the patients are now coming to us with mobile phone videos uh, from which we can verify the seizure type. It's important after taking a history and looking at the video of the patient, which they have bought from home, to do an EEG. And 
EEG done early, within few hours of the seizure, is more likely to be abnormal. In that, an early EEG is likely to pick up an abnormality in as high as 50% patients. Whereas a late EEG done more than 24 hours after the seizure is likely to be abnormal only in 30%. The first EEG may be abnormal in only 30 to 50%. But if we do repeated EEGs, and particularly we do sleep deprived EEGs, the pickup rate of the EEG increases to 80%. Hence, it's very important to do an EEG immediately after a seizure within 24 hours to increase the yield and also try to do an EEG which is, which is sleep deprived because a sleep deprived EEG which includes a sleep recording is likely to increase the yield of the EEG by almost 80%. Now, whenever we've finished uh, doing the EEG, we've finished doing the MRI, we've taken the history and we've confirmed the diagnosis. We start with the first anti-epileptic drug. Now about 47% of patients will respond to the first anti-epileptic drug, which is appropriately chosen for that seizure type. The rest will not respond to that first drug. When we give the second drug, an additional 13%, an additional 13% will show and response. And when we give the third drug, an additional 4% will show and response. There will be a good 35%, which is the red box, which will not respond to three or more medicines. Hence, uh, whenever we manage a patient with medicines, we start with the first monotherapy. If they fail to respond, we switch to an alternative monotherapy or we do a polytherapy with two or three drugs. And if the patient is not responding to two drugs, then <coughs> provide the patient is taking the drugs and provided the patient has epilepsy and not pseudo epilepsy due to psychogenic seizures or syncope and he's taking the drugs in appropriate doses then we say the person is pharmacoresistant and it is this pharmacoresistant category which needs to undergo investigations with a video eg from the neurologist before referring to surgery now when we manage patients with epilepsy there are so many drugs available to us one must remember that one drug is not suitable for all patients with epilepsy. In that, management of epilepsy has to be a personalized and customized exercise as one size, size does not fit all. So this is again just to show you roughly the previous facts which I conveyed to you that the first drug is likely to be effective in 47%, the second drug in 13% and the third drug in another 3 to 4%. And more than three drugs are going to be effective in less than two months. There are different patterns of response to anti-epileptic drugs. And this is a large study again. There are four patterns of response that we as clinicians may see. We may see pattern A, which is when the anti-epileptic drug is started, there is an immediate response within six months <coughs> and the patient remains seizure-free. So the patient remains seizure-free and the response is achieved within six months. So this pattern A is seen in about 37 or 35% of patients. The next pattern of response to an anti-epileptic drug is pattern B. That is, they don't respond within six months, but they show a delayed, delayed response, but it is a sustained response. That is, they remain controlled. So this is known as pattern B, which is delayed and sustained response. And a good 22% show this delayed and sustained response. The pattern C is a fluctuating response. That is when we start an anti-epileptic drugs, drug, they remain seizure free for some time. And then again, they have seizures. Then again, they remain seizure free for some time. And again, they have seizures. And this pattern C is, is seen in 15% of patients. The last category, which is pattern D, is when we start the anti-epileptic drugs, from the time of starting, the patients are never controlled. They are never seizure-free. And this is seen in roughly about 25% of patients. They are never seizure-free, even for the complete year. I told you there is a pattern C, which is a fluctuating response. Now, this fluctuating response is very important to a clinician. Because I, as a clinician, if I start the patient on a new anti-epileptic drug on point A, that is when he is in the upswing of the fluctuation of seizures. Then if I start a new drug, the seizures are not going to be controlled because he is on the upswing of the fluctuation of seizures, which are natural for that particular pattern, which is seen in 15% patients. And the drug is going to be 
a bad drug for that patient and the patient will probably go from doctor to doctor seeking help because he will think the drug which I started has actually caused seizure aggravation. However, when I start the patient who's fluctuating pattern at point B, when he's in the downslope, when the fluctuation is showing a downslope or a decrease in seizures, the patient is going to respond to the medication because he's in the downslope of the fluctuation and is going to think that the drug started is a wonderful drug. Whereas if I start the patient when he's not in the fluctuation phase and he's in the quiescence phase, at point zero, then the person, the drug may remain, uh, the drug may show a neutral response and we may think that there will be an upswing or a downswing which will come and so the patient has become tolerant. So this is also very important to remember in the fluctuating pattern which is seen in 15% of the patients. Whenever we select an anti-epileptic drug, we have to keep in mind several things. We have to keep in mind the seizure type, the epilepsy syndrome, the age of the patient, the gender of the patient, male or woman. We have to keep in, uh, into account the seizure frequency, the underlying pathology, what are the comorbidities and what are the side effects of the medication. All these points have to be kept in mind. So broadly, it can be categorized into these three categories. How we choose an anti-epileptic drug can be anti-epileptic drug specific, that is to the specific seizure or epilepsy syndrome, to the efficacy of that particular anti-epileptic drug, to that particular CSER type, to its adverse effects, to its idiosyncratic reactions, to its chronic toxicities, teratogenicity, particularly in women of childbearing age, pharmacokinetics, potential for drug interactions, formulations available in your country, patient-specific age, gender, other medications which the patient may be taking, particularly in the elderly, comorbidities, whether it is depression, anxiety, or uh, obesity or migraine, financial consideration because there are many new drugs which are very, very expensive and the patient will not be able to afford it. And also the ability to swallow pills or syrup depending on the age of the person. And of course, it is nation specific. There may be some anti-epileptic drugs which are available in India and some which are available in Indonesia which are not available in either kind country. So it is not how good the drug is but how appropriate the drug is when you look at these variable variables which are there in these three columns we should look at how appropriate the drug is for that particular setting in that particular patient <clears throat> now there are old drugs and there are new drugs the advantage of old drugs is that we know them in and out so we know their good effects we know their bad effects we know their long-term side effects and we have a comfort level of usage of these drugs the, dis, the advantage of new drugs is that they have unique mechanisms of actions and they have less interactions. They do not interact, they do not induce other drugs. And they are useful when uh, the woman is of childbearing age, as well as they have a broad spectrum, as well as they are well tolerated. But we do not know much about these new drugs. We really don't know what their long-term side effects are and we are still discovering many of their long-term side effects. So this is just... Uh, uh, you know, a good column to show you how broad spectrum certain drugs are. So when you look at focal seizures or generalized seizures, there are certain drugs which work for all these seizure types. <coughs> and these are really the broad spectrum anti-epileptic drugs, as you can see here, uh, for focal seizures, for generalized seizures, for myoclonic seizures, for absences, for ertonic and tonic. The broad spectrum is truly valproate, lamotrigine, Levetiracetam, topiramate, and zonosamide. So these are really broad spectrum because they work across all seizures, whether it's focal, generalized, absence, myoclonic. Whereas phenytoin, carbamazepine, <clears throat> oxcarbamazepine, they mostly work for focal seizures. They are not going to work for absence seizures or myoclonic seizures or tonic or otonic seizures. Based on the epilepsy syndrome, if a patient has juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, the drug of choice will be valproate. But however, if valproate fails, then we can try lamotrigine, levetiracetam, zonosamide, topiramate, clobazam, and of course now even perimpinil. If the patient has childhood absence epilepsy, the drug of choice is etsuximide and valproate. But we can also try lamotrigine, zonosamide, and topiramate. Other generalized epilepsies, again, the first drug of choice is valproate but we can also try lamotrigine, levetiracetam, clobazam. 
And of course, for West syndrome, it's steroids like ACTH and prednisolone, pyridoxine. For Lennox Gastaut syndrome, it's again valproate, topiramate, and lamotrigine. Now, it's very important to remember though valproate is the first drug of choice for many syndromes, we avoid its use in women of childbearing age because it's pathogenic tension. So, if you go to what is the evidence of the use of all these drugs, there have been uh, two or three landmark trials, and the first is the SENAD1. The SENAD1 for generalized seizures had one arm where there was a distribution of the patients in groups of receiving valproate, lamotrigine, and topiramate for generalized seizures. And it was found that the probability of remaining on the drug was highest with valproate. That means in generalized seizures, valproate was the best drug in terms of probably producing seizure control and the patients wanting to stay on the drug because their seizures were controlled. If you look at the focal epilepsy part of SANAD, then <coughs> among all the drugs, lamotrigine and carbamazepine were equally good for focal seizures. And hence, depending on which drug is available in your country, of course, the less expensive drug is carbamazepine. The more expensive drug is uh, lamotrigine in focal seizures. Now, we also have the result of SENAD2 because SENAD1 had not included levetiracetam. So in SENAD2, which is not yet published, but this was presented in the ILE meeting in Bangkok. In SENAD2, the focal epilepsy had 900 patients and they had three arms, lamotrigine, levetiracetam and zonosamide. And the generalized epilepsy had two arms of 522 patients of valproate and levetiracetam. And the results clearly said that levetiracetam was not not inferior to valproate, meaning valproate has the same effect as levetiracetam and did better. Valproate did better in that it was probably superior to levetiracetam in that there was less treatment failure, there was less chance of inadequate seizure control, there was more time to the first seizure with valproate and there was longer time, 24-month seizure remission. And hence, levetiracetam and valproate were no different in terms of seizure control and probably, except in women of childbearing age, valproate is a better drug in terms of its seizure efficacy than levetiracetam, though levetiracetam was not inferior to valproate. It has been proposed by this study that in a patient with generalized epilepsy, if the patient has not been given valproate, then we will really not know whether they are resistant or not. So to say that a patient with generalized epilepsy is resistant, generalized epilepsy, it is mandatory to use valproic acid. And if the patient responds to valproic acid, then the patient is not resistant, generalized epilepsy, and is probably a responder. Hence, valproate must be tried before we say that it is resistant, generalized epilepsy. <laughs> now, sometimes certain drugs can cause seizure aggravation, anti-epileptic drugs. So, if in a Dravet syndrome patient, we give a sodium channel blocker, there can be aggravation of seizures. As well as in lennox gastaut syndrome, if we give benzodiazepines, there can be an aggravation of seizures. If we give phenobarbiton to a patient who has myoclonus, there can be development of myoclonus and absences. Benzodiazepines can worsen tonic seizures, particularly in lennox gastaut syndrome. Phenytoin can worsen myoclonus and aggravate myoclonus and aggravate absence and generalized seizures. Carbamazepine can worsen patients with JME. It can worsen absence, it can worsen myoclonus and can worsen tonic and ertonic seizures. So also oxcarbamazepine. Etsuximize can cause ertonic status and lamotrigine can worsen myoclonic seizures. So also Batron can also worsen myoclonic seizures. Hence, it's important to remember that certain anti-epileptic drugs, if wrongly chosen for the epilepsy syndrome, can actually worsen the seizures. Now, the next principle of managing uh, pharmacotherapy is that always start with monotherapy. Always start with one drug. If the patient does not respond to that one drug, you can add another drug or you can substitute another drug. I personally like to do a full add-on. That is, the baseline AED is going on and the next AED is added on by me. But some people like to do a substitution. 
that is they add on the new drug they add on the new drug and they taper off the baseline aad and some people like to do a one and a half strategy that is they add on the new drug and they continue the baseline aad the first aad which they had started and then reduce it <laughs> now in which situation should we add a drug and in which situation we should switch the anti epileptic drug so if the patient has shown response to the first anti epileptic drug but not a full response then we can add on the drug if the patient does not have any side effects to the first anti epileptic drug then also we can add on the drug we can also add on drug when no interactions with the second drug are anticipated and when adding both the drugs is going to have a beneficial effect we need to switch the anti epileptic drugs that is stop the first drug start the new drug and then stop the first drug later on when there is an adverse effect to the first drug or when there is worsening of seizures to the first drug or when there is a woman who is likely to get pregnant and so we want to stop the first drug which could be teratogenic and replace it with a safer drug or when the patient is not tolerating or not affording the first drug then also we would like to switch the anti epileptic drug the third variable in the management of medical management is to consider the mechanism of action of drugs the variable mechanisms by which drugs act anti epileptics act the commonest mechanism uh, of action is to reduce the excitatory postsynaptic potentials by working on the sodium influx calcium currents and reducing the paroxysmal depolarization and increase the inhibitory postsynaptic potentials by working on the potassium efflux chloride influx and changing the ph and working on various pumps so the classification of anti epileptic drugs is also based on mechanism of action as either being sodium channel based or calcium current inhibitors or gaba enhancers gaba is a inhibitory neurotransmitter or glutamate blockers which is an excitatory neurotransmitter or carbonic anhydrase inhibitors as well as which work by metabolic acidosis and unknown mechanisms so <coughs> there are drugs which work on the sodium channel inactivation that is by causing sodium channel inactivation they will prevent the cell from getting excited and these drugs are phenytoin carbamazepine valproate and lamotrigine they are drugs which work by reducing the current of the t type calcium channels and hence reducing excitability and these are ethsaxamide and valproate there are drugs which work by increasing the gaba that is either reducing its metabolism or increasing its production and these are gabapentin valproate barbiturates and benzodiazepines and of course tiagabine and vigabatrin so the drugs which work on the gaba are barbiturates benzodiazepines to certain extent progesterone some of them can be uptake inhibitors like tiagabine gaba inhibitors like vigabatrin gab modulators which is stimulatory uh, modulators gabapentin and valproate and some of them can be bro, bro drugs glutamate blockers are also known to us felbamate levetiracetam ampa blockers like topiramate perampenil and other such molecules now is there evidence to say that uh, we should combine drugs based on the mechanism of actions yes there is uh, we would prefer to combine drugs with varying mechanisms of actions like if you combine two sodium channel blockers there's more likely chance of toxicity so you should try to combine a sodium channel blocker with a synaptic recycle protein a this is based on the study by margolis published in jama 2014 of more than 8615 records what they found is when patients were given anti epileptic drug combinations with different mechanism of actions they had greater effectiveness and this effectiveness was seen in terms of longer duration of use of these combinations and low risk of hospitalization and emergency visit de uh, department visits so people or patients who were on combination of anti epileptic drugs with different mechanism of actions had better uh, tolerance and better usage longer term usage of the drugs and had lower emergency department visits because of breakthrough seizures now it is well known that there is a good combination and a bad combination and there are certain good combinations and we should try to limit our combinations to two or three drugs and not beyond three or four drugs 
the best combination is, which is synergistic is thought to be lamotrigine and valproate. So also, uh, there are certain harmful combinations. And the moment you add lamotrigine and valproate, there is a synergistic effect and a supra additive effect. There are harmful combinations. You should not combine two sodium channel blockers. So you would not want to combine carbamazepine and oxcarbamazepine, carbamazepine and lamotrigine. You would not want to combine uh, oxcarbamazepine with topiramate and phenobarbiton with benzodiazepine because there will be excessive drowsiness. <clears throat> so bad combinations are also like phenytoin and valproate. They can enhance their uh, side effects. And avoid combination of sodium channel blockers like phenytoin, carbamazepine, phenytoin, phenobarbiton, etc. Now, the other principle which is important in managing medical management is always start low and go slow. Do not give the first, uh, first dose, full dose, particularly in certain drugs. Some drugs can be loaded day one. Drugs like carbamazepine, lamotrigine, oxcarbamazepine, topiramate, and zonisamide. They need to be built up slowly. You can't give the full dose of carbamazepine on day one. The patient will become ataxic and have diplopia and refuse to take the medicine. If you give lamotrigine full dose day one, they will have skin rash and they may have Steven Johnson syndrome. So you need to build it up very, very slowly, 25 milligram per week increments. Similarly, for topiramate, you have to do 25 milligram per week increments. However, certain drugs like levetiracetam, valproate, they can be loaded IV day one itself in emergency settings, so also phenytoin. It is very important to know that certain drugs which can be loaded, IV, are important whenever the patient presents to us with status epilepticus. So when the patient presents with status epilepticus, we can load these drugs like phenytoin at 20 mg per kg. We can load levetiracetam at 60 mg per kg, lacosamide at 10 to 12 mg per kg, or we, if the patient is not having an IV line, we can give perempanil and topiramate through the Riles tube. So for status, we have used perempanil through the Riles tube as well as topiramate through the Riles tube. So these drugs which can be IV loaded are the drug of choice or can be given day one are the drug of choice in, in patients with status. Now the fifth variable in management of patients, uh, medical management, is what concomitant medications these patients are taking. Because all anti-epileptic drugs have drug interactions. There are enzyme inducers like phenytoin, carbamazepine, phenobarbitone. They are all enzyme inducers and they will reduce the level of the other drugs. So these drugs will reduce the levels of lamotrigine and oxcarbamazepine. Whereas valproate is an enzyme inhibitor and it is going to increase the drug level of lamotrigine. So it's very important to know the drug to drug interactions. And also one must know the interaction between new drugs and old drugs. So if you take the new drugs, the new drugs like levetiracetam virtually has no interaction with the older drugs. Similarly, lamotrigine virtually also has no interactions with the older drugs. However, topiramate can cause an increase in phenytoin. So if you combine topiramate with phenytoin, there can be phenytoin toxicity. Hence, it's very important to know these interactions also. Then, of course, one must know broadly which are the enzyme inducers and enzyme inhibitors because when you give these enzyme inducers in patients who are on, say, ATT, that is anti-tuberculous drugs or antiretroviral drugs or anti-diabetic drugs, then there can be interactions. So carbamazepine, phenobarb, phenytoin. These can also reduce the level of other drugs. And enzyme inhibitors can increase the level of other drugs causing toxicity. The fifth variable in medical management is comorbidities. A patient with depression, you should choose lamotrigine and oxcarb because these are mood elevators. In a patient who has concomitant migraine, you should try to use topiramate and valproate because these drugs are also used for migraine therapy. So you can use the same drug both for migraine as well as epilepsy. A patient who has chronic pain, you should try to use more of carbamazepine, oxcarbamazepine, lacosamide, pregabalin, gabapentin. A patient who is obese, you should give drugs which are likely to make the patient thin like topiramate and zonosamide. We should avoid using uh, pregabalin, gabapentin, valproate which cause weight gain. In a patient who is of childbearing age, we should avoid valproate. In an old elderly patient, we should try to give la lamotrigine and levetiracetam. In Asians, particularly 
and Chinese descent. We should avoid carbamazepine because of the reaction of drugs and we should do HLE 1502 testing before we give carbamazepine in patients of Han Chinese descent. In patients who have kidney stones, we should avoid topiramate and zonosamide because they can cause kidney stones. In patients who are prone to rash, we should avoid lamotrigine and carbamazepine again. So this is according to the comorbidities. But in patients psychiatric comorbidity because psychiatric comorbidity is very common in epilepsy if the patient has a bipolar disorder and mood lability then please consider carbamazepine lamotrigine oxcarbamazepine phenytoin or valproate if the patient has anxiety do not give levetiracetam because levetiracetam can worsen anxiety so also lamotrigine consider giving benzodiazepines and pregabalin if the patient has depression Avoid giving drugs which increase depression by working on the GABA. So you're going to avoid Vigabatrin, Pregabalin, Zonosamide, Levetiracetam. You'll try to give Lamotrigine. If the patient has psychosis, avoid Levetiracetam, Topiramate, Zonosamide, etc. Now what about the other comorbidities? If the patient has heart disease, hepatic disease, has undergone a liver transplant, has undergone a bone marrow transplant, porphyria, is hypothyroid or has HIV, then levetiracetam is a drug of choice. However, if a patient has renal disease, then valproate, carbamazepine, phenytoin are the drug of choice. If the patient has undergone a renal transplant, again, valproate and lamotrigine are the drug of choice. So one must use levetiracetam in all settings, except in renal settings, where valproate and lamotrigine and carbamazepine will be the drug of choice. One must also choose the anti-epileptic drug based on side effects. And there are certain typical side effects of anti-epileptic drugs, which one must be familiar with before we even prescribe it. Like topiramate can cause acute angle closure glaucoma, or it can cause a renal stone. It can cause severe weight loss. It can cause a decrease in word finding. So there can be a kind of aphasia which develops. Similarly, a patient with levetiracetam can develop psychosis, aggression, depression, Similarly, a patient with zonosamide can also have psychosis. And so one must know the drug-specific side effects also. Then the third variable for choosing a drug is convenience. If you give a drug to a patient who has to take the drug only once, they are going to be happy as compared to if the drug has to be taken three or four times in the day. So drugs which can give, be given once a day like zonosamide, perampenil, phenytoin, clobazam, phenobarbitone, they are kind, kind of liked by patients as compared to drugs like carbamazepine, which needs to be dosed two or three times, or valproate, which needs to be dosed two or three times in a day. Then cost. In India, cost is very important because the older drugs, the conventional drugs, are less expensive as compared to the newer drugs like levetiracetam, lamotrigine, oxcarbamazepine, zonosamide, perampenil, Topiramate, they are much more expensive. And you can see here, this is in India. I am not sure how it is in Indonesia. But the older drugs like phen phenobarbitone, phenytoin, carbamazepine, valproate, they are less expensive as compared to the newer drugs, which are two or three times more expensive. And choose the drug which the patient is able to afford. Then, of course, there has to be a shared and informed decision making. One can just start the drug and decide for the patient. Hence, based on the variables which I've just spoken about, based on the cost, based on the factors, whether there is obesity, psychiatric, one has to sit down and talk with the patient and decide which drug is going to be the drug of choice for that particular patient. So typical everyday decisions which we take as clinicians or neurologists in the OPD if it is a young child with developmental delay and seizures, avoid valproate. If there are nocturnal frontal lobe seizures, give carbamazepine. If it's Rolandic epilepsy, try to give carbamazepine and sulthiamine if it's available. If it's tuberous sclerosis with infantile spasms, vigabatrin. If it is epilepsy with ADHD, do not give valproate or levetiracetam. If epilepsy with language disorder, don't give topiramate. If it is an obese patient, no valproate, you will give topiramate, you will give zonosamide. If, if it is a patient of lennox gastroc syndrome with tone you will have benzodiazepines. And if there is anemia, of course, you will not give help. I will now go on to the drug of choice in pregnancy. Now, we know pregnancy is a vulnerable period and women with epilepsy form a special population. 
Now, in the normal population, about 2% of women will have fetal neural tube defects. But in those who are taking anti-epileptic drugs, there, are, there is a doubling of the risk of malformation to 4 to 6%. And in those who are on multiple anti-epileptic drugs, that is more than two anti-epileptic drugs, there is a tripling to about 12%. Now, it's very important to remember that this effect is dose dependent and is worst with valproate. So if you are on a high dose of valproate above 1500 milligram, you can see the malformation rate is as high as 25%. But if you are on a low dose of valproate of less than 700 milligram, the malformation rate is about 5 to 6%. Similarly, for carbamazepine, if you are on a high dose of carbamazepine above 1000 milligram, the malformation rate is about 10%. Is if you're on carbamazepine dose less than 400 milligram, the malformation rate is just 5%. Similarly, phenobarbitone, if you're above 150 milligram, the malformation rate is about 15%. And if you're less than 150 milligrams, the malformation rate is just about 5%. Similarly, for lamotrigine, the malformation rate is just 2.5% if the dose is less than 300 milligram. But it is important to remember that lamotrigine and levetiracetam levels fall drastically almost by three-fourth times in the last trimester of pregnancy and hence the doses may need to be increased in the last trimester of pregnancy. It's also important to remember that anti-epileptic drugs have an effect on the cognition of the fetus. So valproate will cause lower IQs. So mothers who have taken valproate will give birth to babies who have lower IQs and probability of having microcephaly and hence valproate has to be avoided in women with epilepsy. And the childhood development is worse if the mother is exposed to valproate, if the fetus is exposed to valproate because the mother is taking the valproate as compared to levetiracetam. The IQ of the child is also low. If the, if the mother is given valproate or any anti-epileptic drug without folic acid. So if you give folic acid along with the anti-epileptic drug, the IQ is likely to be higher. Hence, please give anti-epileptic drugs to women with folic acid. The protocol for pregnancy is to start folic acid even before pregnancy, just as they marry and they are on anti-epileptic drugs. At 16 weeks of the anti-epileptic drug use in the woman uh, with pregnancy, do a serum alpha fetoprotein. At 18 weeks, do a level 2 ultrasound. And of course, we must examine the child for any defects at 3 months and 1 year following the delivery. The mother should continue to breastfeed because the benefits of breastfeeding outweigh the harms. So do not stop breastfeeding in a woman with epilepsy. It's also important to remember that older conventional anti-epileptic drugs and some new drugs like phenobarbitone, phenytoin, carbamazepine, oxcarbamazepine will increase the clearance of oral contraceptives and hence use drugs like levetiracetam, lamotrigine, uh, laposamide, they do not have much effect on the contraceptive clearance and hence these drugs are better used in patients who are on contraceptives. Anti-epileptic drugs in elderly, elderly again are a special population because they, there's a risk of falls and fractures and we treat the first seizure also in the elderly. And it is important to remember that the best drug is probably going to be lamotrigine and of course levetiracetam. So lamotrigine and levetiracetam, if you have time, then use lamotrigine because lamotrigine you can only start 25 milligram and increase it every week till it reaches the 5-3 milligram per kg dose or 5 milligram per kg dose. But levetiracetam you can give full dose day one. So <coughs> I prefer to use levetiracetam because there's a high chance of recurrence of seizures and so there can be fractures and even sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. And this has been proven in a trial by Kramer, uh, an Eugen Trinker published in Epilepsia, that levetiracetam, which is blue in color, has better seizure outcomes in the elderly. So elderly, the drug of choice is levetiracetam, lamotrigine, zonazamide can also be used. In patients who have weak bones, again, the newer drugs are preferred, like levetiracetam, lamotrigine, topiramate, vigabatrin, or gabapentin. Now, the other new drugs which have come, which are not available in India, I do not know whether they are available in, in Indonesia, is cannabidiol. It's particularly used in patients with lennox gastro syndrome for their drop seizures. It's also used for drug-resistant seizures in Dravet syndrome. However, these are not available in India. 
The next new drug which has just come into the market is cenobamate. And cenobamate trials have been done in focal epilepsy. And you can see here that there were three doses, 100, 200, and 400 milligrams. And this cenobamate produced an improvement. Uh, we still don't have cenobamate in India. And hence, we are waiting for this drug. The other drug which has come into the market recently is fenfluramine. And fenfluramine is particularly useful in Brevi syndrome. Apart from that, again, fenfluramine is a common drug which was used as to reduce appetite in obesity. So I think it may be available in various markets in Asia. It is available in India also. The other new drugs which we have is brevaracetam and uh, perempenil, lacosamide. I'm not sure if they're available in Indonesia and we are using these in a certain select population. Hence, <coughs> at the end of medical treatment, if the patient is continuing to uh, seize, one must again take a step back and think, is my diagnosis correct? It could be that the diagnosis is wrong and the patient does not have epilepsy. The patient has the wrong drug which has been given, like a patient of JME has been given a drug uh, for focal seizures, like carbamazepine. So there is aggravation of seizures. So wrong drug, wrong epilepsy syndrome. Uh, inadequate dose, the patient may not be taking the dose properly, may not, may be leaving the medicine because the commonest cause of breakthrough seizures is the patient not taking the medicine. And of course, the patient discarding the drugs. Various lifestyle factors, if the patient is not sleeping well, if the patient is fasting, particularly Ramadan, what they do or Ramadan, they, they are fasting, so they even fast on their medicines. They don't take their medicines. This can also cause breakthrough seizures. Resistant epilepsy, truly resistant epilepsy is that when two drugs have failed, when they are taken in adequate doses and good drugs for that particular syndrome. In follow-up, we must monitor their drug levels. We must also maintain Caesar diaries. We must ask the patient to come with a Caesar diary every time they come. Okay, so that we know when the Caesar has happened and we can ask them about those Caesars. If you leave it to the patient's memory, they will forget. There are certain predictors for refractory epilepsy. And if you find a patient with epilepsy who is not responding to medication and he has an abnormal MRI, then such a patient should, should be referred for epilepsy surgery or to a center where video EG is done to a neurologist and subsequently to a neurosurgeon who does surgery. The neurologist who does video EG should refer the patient to the neurosurgeon because the surgery can be done only after proving that yes, this is a seizure, it's a true seizure and where the seizure is coming from. No surgery should be done without doing a video EG. Hence, the treatment flow in managing medical management is give the first monotherapy. If they fail, give the second monotherapy or give combination therapy. If they still fail, consider video EG and rule out the pseudo seizures. And if they're true seizures, then go ahead with a team approach where there is it, send the patient to a center where there's a neurologist, there's a neurosurgeon, a neuroanesthetist who is willing to undertake the procedure of epilepsy surgery. And with this, I end my talk. And if there are any questions, I could take them.